Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next in our inaugural lecture series. Uh, I think many of you will know who I am, but for those who don't, I'm Trevor McMillan. I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here at, at Kiel. Um, such occasions are always uh, very pleasant occasions, nerve wracking for the people who are standing behind me, um, but nevertheless very, very pleasant. And it's a great pleasure to welcome colleagues from both within the university and outside, and in particular to Simon's family, a wife, children, parents, um, who are here this evening. And I, some of you have heard me say before, I just have um, one instruction for children. You've got to laugh at your dad's jokes. Okay, so um, I can remember my daughter doing that at, the, uh, at my inaugural, and in fact, her laughing was the most funny thing, or the funniest thing of the evening. So um, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Simon Pemberton, our new professor of human geography, to give his inaugural lecture this evening. I am going to have to read this quite carefully because Simon has had several roles um, and there are several important things that I need um, to say about Simon. He, he graduated um, from the University of Wales in Aberystwyth in 1994 uh, with a first class honours in geography and also did his PhD there. Um, he had research posts in Newcastle and then also back into Aberystwyth before moving out of the sector, indeed, into the Borough Council as the Head of Strategy and Regeneration in Wrexham. Then he moved into Merseyside, into the Social Inclusion Observatory at the University of, of Liverpool, before moving to Birmingham and then on here to Kiel. And from his appointment as a reader, he was appointed a professor in 2016. His research covers two different areas, and I'm sure we'll hear about both of these areas. The new migration and diversity within different populations, and indeed in the restructuring of the state support services that need to go around that. He's held many, many grants and some significant ones, including a very prestigious Leverhulm Fellowship at the moment. Um, some at least one worth over a million pounds. Vice chancellors can get a little bit obsessed with research funding. Uh, as some of you will, will know, it is important that we get it. It's not essential for all subjects. It's also, I have to say, perhaps a little bit more money within the system in some subjects than, than others. And I think it's a, it's a credit to Simon that actually some aspects of uh, human geography in particular aren't necessarily an area that naturally attract, attracts huge amounts of funding. So the fact that he has found his niche, making a significant contribution and achieving a significant reputation in this area really says a lot for the work that he has he's done. And certainly the work that he's done has informed, both at a national and international level, a lot of policy uh, developments that are key for the development of our societies in the future. So that's enough for me. It's a huge privilege for me to, to welcome Simon and to invite him to deliver his inaugural lecture, Migration, Mobility and Place, Living in Different Contexts of Super Diversity. Simon. Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you all for attending tonight. Thanks for your, for your time. It, it really is appreciated. Um, as Trevor's already mentioned, my name is Professor Simon Pemberton. Um, I'm a professor of human geography, and I have long-standing interests, as I'll sort of indicate tonight, um, in the field of migration, and the impacts in particular that migration has had both on urban areas and on rural areas. And I'm going to talk a little bit more perhaps tonight about the urban rather than the rural, but it's important to note that I've looked at, I've looked at both. Um, and it's going to reflect in my talk tonight, and I'm going to particularly look at the impact that increasing migration in the world, and in, within the UK in particular, is having on particular places. And how the nature of those places themselves shape experiences of migration and the movement of people in the city. So that's sort of the, the, the preamble for this evening. Now where do I want to start? 
some lovely pictures of me uh, back in the um, late 1970s. You can tell it's the late 1970s from the top picture. The haircuts and the, uh, the football kits give it away. But that was my primary school, uh, standing on the field uh, in my local village. And then at the bottom, a slightly older me, on the, on the back row. Um, but that was my secondary school. Now, why are those two pictures important? Um, they're important for a number of reasons, because... Um, it sort of takes me back to my sort of initial interest in geography and sort of the teaching that I experienced in geography from a very early age. And practically, it sort of came out in, in, in two different ways. As my sort of parents will, will attest, whenever we went on holiday, whenever we went anywhere, I was always interested in what was around the next corner. So whenever we went on holiday, I was always sent out to explore the place. And I was always very interested in terms of different places and who lived there and what people were doing. So practically, I always had this interest in, in sort of people and places. But additionally, in the context of the school, in primary school and secondary school, one of the things that we, we learned, one of the very first things, was the, the classic Chicago model of urban development. This is sort of the, 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 the Park and Burgess model on the right-hand side. Uh, many of you might remember this yourselves from school, but it's a, sort of the concentric model of urban growth. It was based on Chicago in the 1920s and how urban sort of areas develop. Um, and it, what struck me was I was very interested in this, but also because of the so-called, if this pointer works, let me just check, yep, the so-called zone in transition, this sort of area just adjacent to the city centre, but sort of, um, but, um, and beyond it, sort of what you have are the, are the working class uh, neighbourhoods. Now the zone in transition was sort of the, what some people have defined as the melting pot suburbs. These were areas that lots of migrants, lots of people moved to when they moved to a city and particularly in the context of, of Chicago. And I was very interested in this from an early age in terms of well, what, what happens in these places? Who lives in these places? What are these places like? And these are sort of some of the archetypal sort of conditions in, in the 1920s. This is what that area looked like. So very, often very poor, very down at heel, um, some evidence of sort of slums, uh, and sort of very, um, sort of con much con contestation around the use of, of buildings and the use of land. These were areas where population diversity was greatest, but also where there was often conflict based around ethnic difference and also around racial differences as well. And this was something that really interested me from a very, very early age. And then we move forward slightly, uh, and I found an old geography textbook, Geography and Integrated Approach. I think I've still got this on the shelf somewhere. But when I moved then through into sort of uh, A-level and, and uh, sort of moved away from secondary school into, into sixth form, another thing that sort of struck me was that this interest in place was still very important. Uh, and what we started to talk about, if I remember, during my, my sixth form days was the, the phenomena, the concept of some, some, what people called white flight. And there's a quote here at the top. And this is the idea that communities, that areas may have a tipping point. It was coined in the context of America in the 1950s when lots of people from the, the south of the country moved to some of the northern cities. They moved into the inner city areas. And the, the, the concept of white flight relates to the point that there's a tipping point where the white population starts to move out when the proportion of the population, either black or uh, ethnic minority, gets beyond a particular point. And people have very, there was various different reasons uh, put forward as to why uh, white flight occurred. Some of them which related to sort of the economic development of the city, commuting patterns, for example, changing patterns of work, uh, the fact that the... Um, People were moving out, so actually there was a lack of services in the inner city, and therefore people were moving away. But also people um, talk about white flight being racially motivated, the idea that people moved away from these areas um, because they felt that the racial composition of the inner city was perceived as being unattractive. There was a fear of house prices dropping when the minority communities moved in. And also discrimination, importantly, in housing and lending markets. So these were things that we sort of talked about, and it sort of stuck with me as we've moved through, as I've moved through my career. And I'll come back to this point uh, later in my lecture tonight. We then move forward a little bit more, and the top left is a very young me at Keele in uh, 1990, standing outside the chapel. It was an open day that I 
uh, attended at Kiel um, as a prospective undergraduate. Um, there was no drones on offer then from my, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Alex Nabas. I think Dr. Peter Knight might have been here giving his geography talk, um, but uh, a very young me. Um, but I didn't end up, for a variety of reasons, coming to Kiel. I went to Aberystwyth in the bottom left, where I spent uh, eight very successful, very happy years doing a geography degree and then a PhD and indeed a, post, a postdoctoral position as well. And sort of the focus, my focus on place and my focus on the urban and the focus on the impact of, of sort of mobility and, and, and migration continued through, through this, this, this phase. And indeed, it's reflected um, even now in the context of my career at Keel. The slides on the right, if there's any first or second year students in here will relate to the, to the slide. It's, it's actually a session that I teach on world cities in, in year one. But the focus around migration and place remains. And then we sort of move forward. So I guess so my career in, in Aberystwyth, with uh, my, my academic career, sort of uh, came to a point where I decided to move into practice. So as, 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 as uh, Professor McMillan has, has highlighted, I, I moved to North Wales, and I worked in practice for four years. I was head of a regeneration and urban planning unit, uh, dealing with lots of people and lots of different communities, lots of different challenges. Um, and after four years, I decided that I wanted to put that experience uh, back, back into sort of academia, back into academic life. Uh, and I moved to Liverpool, to the University of Liverpool, where at the time they were setting a Merseyside social inclusion observatory. They were setting a, a new observatory up, funded by European money, um, and looking really at what should be done in the more deprived areas of, of Merseyside. So a very exciting initiative uh, which I was leading at the university. And, and one of the things that we were asked to do at the time was um, a project looking at the impact of European enlargement. So in 2004, Europe was enlarged, and we had the so-called accession aid countries, the, the countries in light green here, the Polands, the Czech Republics of this world, joined the European Union, and we were asked to look at the impact that this was going to have on the northwest. So we thought, well, okay, we'll, we'll take this project on. And we thought that it was going to be a relatively simple task to begin with. Why did we think that? Well, this document, it's pretty hard to find this these days, but I do have a copy uh, on file, I kept it, um, talked about the potential impact of um, European enlargement on the UK. And the document was actually quite dismissive. So this was a, an official government report produced by the Home Office where it suggested that the impact of Eastern European enlargement was going to be somewhere in the region of 5,000 to 13,000 net EU immigrants per year. Even in the worst case scenario, migration to the UK as a result of Eastern enlargement of the EU is not likely to be overly large. And then, of course, we see this, where actually this is the current position of, uh, in terms of migra migration to the UK, where we have somewhere, the estimates vary wildly, but somewhere between perhaps 800,000 and 1.2 million people from Poland have come over to the UK and settled. And again, we have uh, various numbers, two to 300,000 uh, or so from some of the other European accession countries. So clearly um, a big impact um, that European enlargements had on the UK and indeed the northwest of England. So this was something that we explored. It was something that we uh, were interested in as a, as a unit, as, a, as an observatory. And what we were particularly interested in was looking at um, some areas that were actually in decline. So the pictures here are from Kensington. Kensington is an area of uh, North Liverpool. It's quite close to the University of Liverpool. Uh, my daughter and I actually drove through there yesterday morning on the way to, or, uh, on the way to, to a, a swimming uh, um, competition. And uh, this is a really down at, down at heel area, but um, there's an interesting dynamic going on because whilst lots of people were moving out of this area, indeed, um, the area has continued to lose population. What we found was that with European enlargement and lots of Europe, Eastern European migrants coming to the UK, they were moving in to some of these areas. And there were some obvious reasons as to why they were moving in. They were moving in because uh, property was very cheap, because nobody wanted to live there. And also some of these houses, they're quite nice houses, or they were quite nice houses a very long time ago. And therefore, they're quite large. 
and they acted as houses of multiple occupation. So you had lots and lots of migrants living together in some pretty squalid conditions, to be honest, um, but relatively cheaply. So it created a new dynamic, a new demand for housing in an area that actually was, was seen as, a, as an area of decline. Now, that, that obviously has waxed and waned over the years, but what it highlighted was the importance of place, the importance of place itself in shaping patterns of, of migration and mobility uh, in the city. And that takes me forward then to where I moved next. I then moved to Birmingham, and at Birmingham, um, they set up uh, an institute for research into superdiversity, and I became a fellow of the institute, and in particular, uh, my interest in place have, um, have, have been reflected in terms of some of the work that's been taken forward um, by the Institute. Um, the Institute itself was very interested in this idea of increasing population diversity in the UK and increasing complexity of populations in cities. And these are two maps, two maps of, of Birmingham, which just show... Um, um, they the, the show two things. The map on the left shows, uh, it's a ward map, and it shows how many um, new migrants of different ethnicities live in particular wards. And what's interesting from the map is that, in terms of the map, it's an interesting aspect, there's at least 37 self-declared ethnicities in, in, in any ward, and much more than that in most. And equally, the map on the right um, is that there's at least 12 sub-regions of birth in any one ward um, in the city. And again, much more than that in some parts of, of Birmingham itself. So there's this idea that areas of, of Birmingham, areas of cities in the UK, are becoming increasingly diverse through patterns and processes of migration. And what, what's been coined is the term superdiversity. Superdiversity, diversity that supersedes, that extends beyond anything that's been previously experienced. So rather than just focusing on different ethnic groups in the city, when we talk about superdiversity, we talk about individuals with different ethnicities, different age groups, different gender, different class, different faith denominations, different immigration statuses, different reasons for migrating, different migration channels. And, it, and what we see is a fragmentation where traditionally, to, 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 areas, to countries like the UK, we had many migrants moving from relatively few countries. And what we've moved to now is um, many migrants moving from lots of countries, but to lots of other different places. And, and therefore what we see uh, in, 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 in cities like Birmingham is a huge spread of migration across the city, of migrants across the city, uh, but increasing diversity in terms of who those people actually are. And that's what sort of super diversity tries to capture. Now, as I've mentioned already, what super diversity tries to do is move beyond a focus just on ethnicity itself. Now, it's a little bit blurred, and I can see that from, from where I'm standing, but what this diagram attempts to show is the different dimensions of superdiversity. So it's not just about ethnicity when we talk about superdiverse populations. We need to think about socioeconomic status as being critical in shaping experiences within the city and within particular neighbourhoods. We need to think about social and cultural norms. We need to think about the political and legal status of immigrants as well. But what superdiversity also does is it allows us to focus on the non-migrant population as well as the migrant population. So that's really important. We need, when we talk about areas of superdiversity, yes, we need to think about different migrants, old and new, different faiths, different ethnicities, different nationalities and so on. But we also need to think about non-migrants. And that's what the superdiversity can be, label can be very helpful um, in, terms of, in, terms of, in terms of a focus. Where does that take me then? I guess that takes me to, to sort of the two, two sort of key themes that I want to talk a little bit about tonight. And I've sort of touched upon these already. First of all, for the next sort of 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about the importance of super diverse places in shaping what I've called migrant placemaking and migrant settlements in the city. I'm really interested in exploring how this super diversity that we see, the fact that we have increasing super diversity in cities and at a neighbourhood level, how does that play out? How does that shape 
how migrants make place? How do they settle in the city? And secondly, what are the implications of that for patterns of mobility in the city and patterns of movement in the city? And indeed, as, as, as we've sort of talked about in the preambles, it reflects some of the research that I've been doing over the last 10 to 15 years. So I want to focus on these two, two issues in particular. So if we take the first issue, which is about the uh, importance of um, uh, the, uh, particularly looking at the uh, idea of placemaking and looking at um, the way in which super diverse places shape migrant placemaking, it's important. And it's important because of all of the things that are going on in the world at the moment. This is a picture of uh, the US-Mexico border. On the left, San Diego, US. Uh, on, uh, on the right, Tijuana. My Mexican's not, not brilliant, but uh, you can see the, the, the actual line quite clearly between the two countries. And this is something clearly in, in, the, in the current context that Donald Trump's been talking about, a new wall. Um, what we're seeing is, is what Suzanne Hall has talked about as increasingly punitive migration regimes, increasingly a securitization of borders, a reassertion of the nation state. And this is really important when we actually then start thinking about how migrants integrate into places and that process of migrant placemaking. And we have sort of uh, reporting um, in some of the national press, Keep Out, Britain is full up, which sort of reasserts this issue about uh, bordering and this idea of, of, of the impacts that migration is having on particular countries and in particular areas. And that's, on the one hand, we have this sort of punitive sort of migration, migration regime, the increasing reassertion of borders. And yet, on the other hand, we're living in an ever-increasing sort of globalizing world. And people talk about this as the liberal paradox. On the one hand, we need migrants, but on the other hand, um, they, they can be perceived as, as, as problematic. And the quote on the left is really interesting. It was just something that I picked up. It was actually written 35, over 35 years ago, which talks about this globalization that was going on and this idea that we can't just have places just to be with people we want to be with. It's, we're finished with that kind of, kind of isolating. So we need to think about this, this broader sort of context that's important and which shapes the way in which migrant placemaking and migrant integration in the city takes place. And that takes me into migrant placemaking. What do we mean by migrant placemaking? Um, Gupta in 92, this is quite a useful definition, talks about the structures of feeling that bind space, time and memory in the production of a location. And I think practically migrant placemaking is important for a number of reasons. It's important for migrants in, in the context of avoiding discrimination through their ability to uh, present a collective identity. It can provide a safe haven for those who are visibly different. But it can also be problematic. It can lead to displacement, it can lead to conflict, and it can lead to racism um, in particular cities and in particular neighbourhoods. And Nick Gill, a geographer, has talked about where migrant placemaking works and, and works well. And he also talks about where migrant placemaking can go wrong. So he talks about ideal and pathological processes of placemaking. So he talks about four different stages of, of placemaking, where if you take the ideal model, migrants agree and attempt to project a common identity via place. The place itself generally reflects the migrant cohort. Receiving communities are generally receptive to migrants. And new migrants who arrive make new connections with older migrants and there's generally affinity with existing migrant places. But on the other hand, it can go wrong. He talks about pathologies of placemaking. So migrants may struggle to agree or project a common identity. Some, element, some migrants might feel excluded. Some host communities might not be receptive. And new migrants might feel alienated. Now, that's important as a, as a model. But the assumption with the model is that migrant placemaking takes place in concentration areas of one ethnic group. Single ethnic groups make place. And the neighbourhood, therefore, is an expression of a single ethnic or national identity. And it involves a new minority identity replacing a previous minority identity. And what I want to do is explore, and what I've done, is explore that in the context of super diverse areas. Is this the case in super diverse neighbourhoods? What happens if the populations as they are in super diverse areas are more fragmented and more evolving? 
What happens if there's multiple identities, multiple ethnicities, multiple nationalities, and indeed within group differences in the population? So this is something that's been of real interest to me over the last five or, or six years. And it's work that I've therefore undertaken in a number of cities in the UK, Birmingham being one and Liverpool being another. So what I've done with colleagues is worked uh, in a number of these areas on my own, but again with, with other people as well. And we've looked um, at this process of placemaking in two particular neighbourhoods um, as part of a, a much broader research project. One, Handsworth, which is an area of Birmingham, for any of you who know it, which has a very long history of diversity, a long history of migration. And the second area is Kensington, as I mentioned already, in Liverpool, which is more, a much more recently diversifying area, yet increasingly super diverse. So what we're trying to explore is the way in which these super diverse places shape migrant placemaking in different ways. And therefore, we can use the model to start exploring how migrant placemaking is taking place in these different contexts. So if you take an area like Handsworth in Birmingham, population diversity is the dominant identity of Handsworth. It's got a long history of diversity. It's got a long history of people moving in and out, people moving in and all, out all of the time of this neighbourhood. And the sheer diversity of the neighbourhood is the identity of the neighbourhood. It's projected through the individuals who live and work in the neighbourhood. And that is sufficiently broad to appeal to many people. It attracts many people. The quote here, you know what it's like. They've got everyone from the globe and plotted them here. It's really diverse. It's amazing. We can't say you're black, you're whatever, because there's so many people. It's really, really beautiful. But actually, as well, what we found was that there's some evidence that not everybody connects with that diversity identity of the neighbourhood. Particularly Eastern Europeans found it more problematic. Um, somebody here saying, I want to move to a place where I can find some people who relate to us. We feel completely isolated. So whilst on the face of it, migrants can agree and project a common identity through a super diverse place around the, the issue of diversity itself, that doesn't quite work for everybody. And it certainly doesn't work in the context if you take Kensington. Kensington, I've said, is a much more recently diversifying neighbourhood where there's rapid movements of people in and out of the neighbourhood, lots of new populations moving in all the while. And that in itself means that it's undermined a common neighbourhood identity based around diversity. This, somebody says there's just too many immigrant groups at the moment. And again, Eastern Europeans particularly struggle to project a common identity. Somebody, mentioned, somebody referred to all the Polish people are complaining that there are a lot of black people. So there's some tensions there within the community of Kensington. And if we move to the second aspect of, of, of migrant placemaking, do, do the, does the place itself represent those who live there? Well, again, in Handsworth, we have lots of diverse facilities that reflect the people who live in the neighbourhood. But actually, not for, not for all. Some of those facilities are more reflective of, historic, of the historic dominant ethnic groups in the area. And I'll come back to that point at the end tonight. And therefore, there's questions as to whether the facilities in the area need to adapt a bit faster to reflect the increased population diversity of the area. And again, a quote here that sort of suggests that. And some people even said that they connected with the neighbourhood perhaps not because it maybe represented their identity particularly well, but because it did so better than another part of the city. Now in Kensington, the problem again is, 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 is slightly more acute. The facilities certainly not, were not reflective of those people who were living there. The neighbourhood again was changing too quickly. Thus many people feel very excluded and don't connect with the identity of the neighbourhood. The population changes so fast, nobody stays for that long. You're always a foreigner here. It's like being a visitor. So there, again, there are problems in areas of increasing superdiversity in terms of whether they reflect those who live there. And then we move into the third aspect. Are receiving communities receptive and positive? So in the context of superdiverse places, what do we find? And again, there's some interesting differences between the two communities. In Handsworth, newcomers felt that the population was generally receptive. The neighbourhood is welcoming. And again, it goes back to this history and culture of long-standing diversity in the area. Again, Kensington, because of its recent diversification, that's too new to be a defining characteristic of the neighbourhood. People need time to adjust to new inflows of migrants.
And this then sort of made, it, made us think, it made me think about, well, what, what, what is the position then with perhaps the non-migrant white British community? What, what, what do they think about this, this increasing super diversification of places? And we did a bit of work around this, and I've explored this in, in, again in Liverpool and, and in Birmingham. Um, and what we found with generally was that actually the white British community, non-migrant community, generally embraced migration and generally embraced superdiversity because it brought new investments, it brought new facilities, it brought increased diversity of choice. But there were some issues around the challenge of affordability with more people moving in, house prices and rents were going up, and indeed a lack of choice, they felt, for some in certain areas. But actually, the, the, the picture is reasonably uh, positive uh, on the whole. And then finally, what we then sort of think about in terms of the migrant placemaking agenda is the extent to which new migrants connect with those who are already there. And again, in Handsworth, that was very evident, particularly with non-European migrants and those who are more visibly different because they could blend in with the diversity of the neighbourhood. But for some new European eight migrants who were less familiar with diversity, um, that was more problematic. One person said, I haven't built any strong links here at all. In Kensington, very different. Few respondents interviewed felt they had any affinity with the neighbourhood. The neighbourhood functioned like a dormitory. It's just simply a cheap place to live. And the high turnover of residents, plus experiences of racism, provided fewer opportunities for new migrants to develop an affinity with the neighbourhood. And maybe, as diversity in the area becomes less remarkable, this may change. Now, what I wanted to do was just run through that quite quickly, just to show you how migrant placemaking can play out in super diverse areas, or not, as the case may be. But what do we learn from this? Well, we learned three things pretty quickly. One, in the context of super diverse neighbourhoods, diversity identity placemaking is more of a concern than migrant identity placemaking, and which generally is being focused upon in neighbourhoods with a dominant, dominant ethnic or national identity. Secondly, the newness of populations and rapid population change are very evident. We saw that in Kensington. And this can undermine placemaking for some people. And thirdly, and importantly, the importance of visible diversity is also, uh, is also really, um, really something we need to think about. The diversity of super diverse neighbourhoods attracts some migrants, but it might repel or turn away others who are not so familiar with visible di differences in the population. And that takes me into the, the sort of second bit of tonight. What I've been working on, again, in parallel with, 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 with the first stream of work, is looking at the importance of the neighbourhood itself in shaping patterns of mobility in the city. And this is where my Leverhulme uh, research has, has come into play. And what, we've, what you find is that the if you read the literature, the neighbourhood is seen... Uh, as mattering, it's important in terms of where people move from and where people move to. And the changing nature of a neighbourhood can shape residential mobility. It can shape where people move to and from. But how do the features of super diverse neighbourhoods shape residential mobility? We know very little about this at the moment. And it's really important that we look at this. There are other aspects, there are other influences that shape residential mobility. We can talk about discrimination in housing markets, as I've mentioned already. We can talk about economy. But what I particularly was interested in, in here, in terms of, the, some of the, some of the work I've been doing, was the importance of the neighbourhood itself in shaping patterns of residential mobility. So again, um, the focus of the, the Leverhulme research over the last couple of years has been on Birmingham, but a different area this time. Handsworth, again, as an area of uh, of diversity, long established area of diversity as I mentioned already, but the other area was Ladywood, a very different community just on the edge of the city um, which has had the highest number of migrants in the city, in the city of Birmingham over the last 10 years but it's a very mixed community there's lots of different communities there and where the, the white uh, British community forms about 50% of the population so it's increasingly diverse but Arguably, is it super diverse? That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question to, to, to ponder, which I'll, I'll talk through. And what, what I think is important is one, two, and three, not one, one, and one. Uh, but there are three ways which I'm suggesting that super diverse neighbourhoods shape residential mobility. 
First of all, the diversity of super diverse neighbourhoods attracts some people but repels others. I've, I've talked a little bit about this already, but I'm going to go a little bit further. So super diverse neighbourhoods act as diversity attraction. That's what I'm calling it. They're, they're attractive to people because they're diverse and they shape patterns of mobility as a consequence. Secondly, the importance of ethnicity in the context of super diverse neighbourhoods. I've said that super diversity takes us beyond ethnicity, but actually what I'm arguing through my research is that ethnicity remains central. It's really important in shaping patterns of experiences within neighbourhoods and patterns of mobility in the city. And thirdly, I also wanted to, uh, my argument is that the transiency or the rapid change of super diverse neighbourhoods also serves to attract some and indeed um, it makes, makes these areas unattractive for others. So this, this thing I call transit attraction is also important. So I just want to run through these quickly because I think it's really important in terms of returning to this concept of white flight that I referred to earlier because there's some really interesting nuances going on. So if we think about super diverse neighbourhoods and the idea of di their, their, their diversity as being attractive to people, I've mentioned this already. Um, this person here talks about Hansworth. People here are not arrogant about other people's ways. I've lived in areas where people do not like who you are just because of the colour of your skin. If you're going to live next to people on that level, you'll find yourself in trouble. So Hansworth offers the opportunity to, to, to move away from that sort of scenario. It, the, the population is, is diverse. I've, I've said it has a diverse identity, and therefore people um, see that as being attractive. Now, Eastern European migrants, I've mentioned a little bit already, have said that some, uh, some, some people we, we interviewed have been reasonably uncomfortable. With, they're not familiar with diversity. Now, it's been argued in the literature that Eastern, many Eastern European migrants are white and they use their whiteness for invisibility, for cultural fit and residential choice, particularly in the context of a country like the UK. But Hubbard's work alerts us to this idea of unmarked whiteness. Unmarked whiteness. And what, that, what, what he refers to here is the idea that um, whiteness, the, the, the idea is, is that depending upon how long you've been in the country, depending on how much investment you're perceived to have put into the country, and how hard you've worked to protect the national thing, whatever the thing might be, this idea of authenticity, that that can shape the degree to which you are seen as being marked or unmarked in terms of your whiteness. And indeed, the language and accents of Eastern European migrants um, can act as a limitation because for, so, for some people it, it can, it, that, when they hear uh, languages which they're not uh, familiar with, uh, particularly host populations who uh, are not familiar with maybe with, with migration and difference, they see that as a threat. Now interestingly what's happening in, the, in areas like Birmingham is that with the EU referendum for last year um, what's happened is that we've seen evidence of discrimination against Eastern European communities. And therefore, rather than move away from these areas of diversity, actually what's happening is that they're moving in. Europe, Eastern European migrants are now embracing this diversity that we see in areas like Hansworth. They're moving away to avoid discrimination by the majority white host community. And the quote here, again, sort of suggests that. I've had friends who've decided to leave to move, whether they're only English, only white people living there, and now they live in fear that maybe their, their windows are going to be broken. Uh, I don't have to worry about that because everybody's from abroad here. I don't feel like an outsider. So there's this idea of diversity attraction working at a number of levels. But what we're seeing almost is a new form of what I would say is minority white flight. So we've got a minority group in the, in the UK, but they're actually, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flight away from the white host community. An interesting variation on this, this concept of white flight. Secondly, as I've, we've sort of alluded to as well, super diverse neighbourhoods can be attractive to some, but um, might be more problematic for others. And um, whilst people like Stephen Vertovesh have argued that super diversity takes us well beyond ethnicity, the research that I've undertaken starts to highlight that ethnicity remains central to the experiences of people in the city and indeed their mobility patterns. So what the research in Birmingham has highlighted is the continuing importance of ethnic facilities and indeed people talked about ethnic enclaves 
in communities like Handsworth. And actually what they said is that this was attractive for some because they could move in and it would, they would get support, social capital and so on. They could avoid discrimination elsewhere in the city. But actually people perceived there to be a dominance of two or three ethnic groups. And therefore communities often remain divided around, around, along ethnic lines. And again the quote sort of highlights this is a new migrant who's moved into, um, into, moved into Handsworth. So we need to think about the continuing importance of ethnicity, but not just in terms of white communities or white Eastern Europeans or minority white communities, but also Deborah Phillips, a geographer, talks about she, this notion, this concept of brown flight she talks about. And she says that there's evidence in certain cities like Leeds of brown flight occurring. Now, what I found in, the, in my research through looking at various cities in the UK, particularly Liverpool, particularly Birmingham, is that there is some evidence that brown flight is, is, is happening. People are moving away from areas like Handsworth and Ladywood. But they're moving away for two reasons. One, based on perceptions of safety, that they feel with newcomers coming into the area, they don't feel as safe anymore. And secondly, therefore, that links into this idea of a politics of belonging based around newness, that actually you belong, if you're, there for, if you're there longer, you're not new in the community, you somehow have more ownership of the community than if you're new. So there's something about newness and something about safety that is shaping some communities to move away from the area. And it has lots of different forms. But when you look at the interview material, very much the recent arrival of Bulgarians and Romanians in, in cities like Birmingham has seen to be problematic by a number of different minority communities. And they blame the newcomers for the problems of the neighbourhood. And maybe this is ever the case thus, that anybody who moves in, who seems to have a different way of life, different ways of living, um, gets blamed for the problems of that particular area. And therefore, we need to think very carefully about how we respond to these types of problems. But certainly, um, some evidence of that taking place. But also, Eastern European migrants, as I said, some, while some were attracted by the diversity of these areas, some also, uh, we felt there's a bit of a split, some people also felt that the facilities in the area, it's not just the people in the area that they were unfamiliar with, but it's the facilities and the infrastructure of the area that they're also unfamiliar with. And therefore, they've subdued their backgrounds to try and avoid discrimination, and they often feel that they, 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 they just need to sort of um, be careful about what they do because they don't feel comfortable with um, the, what they perceive as the predominant ethnic minority groups in the neighbourhood. And you have quotations like this. Indeed, what you also find is that Eastern European communities will not go into these areas even to visit the areas. There's a, this idea of white minority white avoidance, which is important here. So Polish communities, again, that we spoke to said, well, we, we, we're not uh, entirely convinced that we want to go into Handsworth because of the facilities there don't necessarily reflect what types of things we want. So they tend to avoid the area. It's not just the people, it's the infrastructures that they talked about as well. And then finally, we can talk about the idea of the neighbourhoods, the super diverse neighbourhoods being transient, about this idea of being very chip, lots of population churn, lots of movement in and out of these neighbourhoods. And as I've mentioned, Ladywood is an area where there's been lots of people moving in and out um, over the last 10 years. Now, this transiency, this change, is really attractive for some groups because they can just basically disappear. They can just go into these areas, live, go to work, come back, and so on. So for many Eastern Europeans, again, that was important. They could move away from the majority white community in other parts of the city, but they could also move away from other Eastern European migrants. There's different interpretations as to how well Eastern European migrants get on with each other. Some people say they get on very well, and there's studies which prove that, and there's other studies which actually undermine that. What we found in this study in Birmingham was that, uh, that, that some people felt that was more problematic. So, just bring it to start to bring things together, what do we learn? The key thing, I think, which comes out from a discussion around super diversity and super diverse areas and super diverse neighbourhoods is that ethnicity still matters, but it intersects with other dimensions of super diversity. 
So despite increasing superdiversity that we, we, we can see and which is evident, ethnicity still shapes neighbourhood experiences and practices of mobility. And what we've seen is discrimination going on between different ethnic minority groups in some of these areas, but it's based around this, this idea of safety, newness, and also the infrastructure or not, which might be in place. We also see new forms of white flight, but this, this idea of minority white flight, if we take, particularly take the Eastern European community that have arrived since 2004, we see multiple forms of mobility going on. Sometimes Eastern Europeans have moved away from the host community, particularly in the context of the EU, refer EU referendum and, and Brexit. So, sometimes they've moved away from other Eastern European migrants themselves, and sometimes they've moved away from context of superdiversity. And sometimes they also avoid these areas. So there's interesting patterns of mobility going on within the city. And finally, I guess, just bringing it, to the final, bringing it back to where we started, increasingly super diverse areas therefore still act as zones of transition. And this quote sort of highlights it quite nicely. Ladywood, as an increasing area of super diversity, serves as an initial reception area in the city. It serves the function of a jumping off place for people when they first land. It's affordable. I think it's a good place. People are not going to stay. So I think it serves its purpose in that way pretty well. Which brings me to the, the final sort of five minutes or so of, of tonight's uh, lecture. I've talked about the different features of super diverse neighbourhoods and how they might shape migrant placemaking in different ways. I've talked a little bit about how super diverse neighbourhoods shape patterns of mobility and indeed based upon this idea of visible diversity um, and indeed sort of how that might shape patterns of, of, of movement. But what can we do? What, what should we be doing? How do we respond to some of these issues? Now, this is where my work, again, has been going on for a number of years. But I want to just draw attention to one particular piece of research which I think is quite interesting. Now, this is a report that was produced earlier this year by the Urban Land Institute, the ULI. They're a, a, a sort of an umbrella organisation, worldwide organisation, with about 8,000 members, planners, real estate uh, practitioners, architects, and so on. And they asked myself and a number of people at the Institutes for Superdiversity at Birmingham to write a report looking at the impact of what they defined as mass migration on uh, planning and real estate in European cities. So we've, had, we've seen lots of refugees moving into Europe from, because of the problems that we've seen in Syria and beyond. What impact is this having on European cities? That was what they asked us to do. And how should planners respond? So I've been very interested in exploring this um, over the last year or so. And what comes out from an urban planning perspective are two main strategies to respond to these new flows of, of migration and, and sort of how to handle these new flows in the context of cities. One, this idea of redistribution. We need to redistribute populations within the city to avoid segregation. And secondly, we need to concentrate on social mixing. It's been uh, this notion of social mixing, mixing people together to get integration. It's been, uh, the idea has been around for a number of years. But there's some really interesting things coming out when you look at the evidence across Europe. And I just want to sort of highlight a couple of things to you. Firstly, in terms of this idea of redistributing people you see various different strategies emerging in terms of redistribution. And there are real questions as to which one we should do and whether they work or not. So in some areas, in some, some, some countries, what we've seen is a redistribution of population to different areas of the country. So in Sweden they do this and in Germany they do this. So you have refugees coming into a city and then they redistribute them sorry, across the country. So someone here says, you can imagine coming from Syria and having people living in Malmo, relatives living in Malmo, you come to Sweden and then all of a sudden you're shipped 1,500 kilometres kilometers north to a place where no one lives. And this actually happens. And then surprise, surprise, what we find is secondary migration where people move back over time of their own accord. And then we have issues around whether we get overcrowding and problems in, in the context of urban planning. But one strategy that planners are doing, have used, is try to redistribute pop, uh, populations to avoid segregation of populations in cities. Secondly, they talk about moving 
migrants to peripheral areas. They've, and someone here says, they've kind of shipped people to places where no one wants to live and where there are no jobs, where there's no underlying economy, and that leads to segregation and social problems. So in Sweden, they had the Million Homes Programme in the 1960s and 1970s. One million new public uh, houses over a 10-year period. Often constructed on the edge of cities, didn't work, lots of problems with them, now vacant, and what they've done is they've moved migrants and refugees into, into these, uh, these types of places. Other strategies involve moving migrants to every area of the city. Quote here, the ambition from the city now is that this accommodation for migrants should be located in every part of the city, not only in parts where we had, where we had a lot of immigrants earlier. And then this question of where you move migrants and refugees to. Do you move them to more affluent areas or do you move them to more challenging areas? One quote here, it's interesting in that the more challenging responses have been in better off upper class not working class areas, as it's felt that migration impacts on the value of real estate. And then someone else says something, something entirely different. But the point is migrants typically don't want to go into these poor areas as they're not welcome there. And I think it makes a lot of sense for them to try to get to the richer areas where people tend to help them and are much more open for including them into their societies and working on integration. So there's different strategies of distribution and redistribution going on in the context of urban planning. And indeed, as you say, that in, in interfaces and shapes processes of migrant placemaking. But what planners have also done is try to undertake um, social mixing. So we see strategies about trying to provide affordable housing, but not just for refugees or for migrants, but interestingly for everybody, so all low-income populations within the city, so that we don't discriminate by one group or another. Providing housing for different stages of the life cycle. There's a re an increasing recognition that you need to provide different types of housing for, for, across the life cycle. So young people need different types of housing to people who have families. Families need different types of housing to those people who are, in maybe, uh, who are more mature, who are slightly older. So we need to develop housing solutions for different stages of the life cycle. And we also need to link our solutions into broader employment, health and education initiatives. And again, this quote says this, if you put everybody in a place where no, everybody's the same and no one has a job and no one has the right environment to make their own life, that leads to segregation problems. So there's been an emphasis on social mixing as well as on redistribution by urban planners. And there's some interesting examples being developed. So if you go to Copenhagen, um, they have a project called Urban Rigger. And what they've done here is that they've repurposed disused shipping containers as floating homes on the river um, they were initially used to address a student housing problem. We haven't got any uh, rivers or uh, sea anywhere near us, so I don't think we can... We might not be able to do that one here. But, um, but they're seen as being adaptable and mobile and that they're cheap and they can be quite a speedy and flexible solution um, to housing shortages. And we see other initiatives that urban planners are also dealing with. So there's an issue around security. So if you don't provide secure accommodation for refugees and people moving into the city, that can be problematic. So again, this person says this. With the mobile homes we've been using, there's been some racism and some negative campaigns. We've not got security guards to, guide, to guard the site at night. But we also need stability when we're settling migrants and refugees into the city. The integration process is faster, somebody said. If you get a real apartment for a four-year term, instead of having to go into temporary accommodation options and then have to move after a few months. The four-year rental allows time for children to settle in school and find work in the local area. And, coming to a close, there are other ways that urban planners are trying to integrate uh, new populations into urban areas. Some have tried to celebrate the increasing super-diversity of cities. So here, this idea about developing a new park... Um, we designed a park that brought benches from their, own, their, their home country. You don't sit on a Danish bench in the park, but you sit on one from Sarajevo or something from Marrakesh. You slide on a slide from Japan. We're celebrating the diversity of the neighbourhood. So this celebration of superdiversity is seen as a way of integrating populations. And indeed, using refugees and migrants themselves in designing solutions. So in, somebody in Sweden says there was a village where you had a lot of empty buildings. They had a refugee camp fairly close by, they started to convert and rebuild some of the old houses and by the labour of the refugees, they renovated the buildings, they learned Swedish, 
Whilst doing that, they were able to stay and rent the house that they'd renovated themselves. So this idea of co-production or engaging migrants in solutions themselves. So, bringing it to a clue, my sort of final slide, I guess, I've talked about this, this sort of process of migrant placement, and I've tried to do that in the context of super diverse areas, and I've tried to explore patterns of mobility, and I've come to a point where we're looking at responses to this increasing super diversity. But what we need, I would argue, is a much more differentiated response than what we're seeing at the moment. So, I've talked about cities such as Liverpool today and Birmingham. I've talked about some European cities. But we need to think about the different types of solutions for different types of cities. So if you think about the refugee crisis, there are arrival cities where people move to and who, where, they, where people may stay for a relatively short period of time. And there are destination cities where people might want to settle for, for in, in the longer term. We need different types of solutions based upon these different types of cities and what people are doing. We also need to think about different responses over time. So humanitarian aid in the short term, absolutely, if we're talking about refugees moving into cities. But what types of housing solutions, um, employment solutions do we need in the medium and longer term? And finally, we need to think about different types of migration. You know, European migration, into, Eastern European migration in 2004 was very much a labour migration of its time. People moved promptly for work. Refugee migration is taking place as a consequence of forced migration in the context of Europe at the moment. We need to think about the different types of planning solutions for these different types of migration. And that's the end of my talk for tonight. I've tried to cover a lot of ground, but I, I hope you found that interesting. Thank you.